I mean, looking back on EAT, I see that really it's, it's part of this kind of uh, idealistic, revolutionary fervor of the 60s. Sometimes I say it's not about art, it's not about technology, it was about revolution. <laughs> EAT really came of age in a moment of the counterculture. Artists understanding that culture could play a role in society. In the mid 60s, New York's art world was exploding. A tightly knit group of artists, including Robert Rosenberg and John Cage, were introducing completely new ways of thinking. We're talking about the foremost experimental artists of their time. There was room for mischief and activity. A communication between people is only an electronic impulse away. Only a few miles away in suburban New Jersey, an equally experimental group was engaging with some other wildly innovative ideas. Beep, 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 boop, bop, boop. Bell Labs was the country's foremost research facility. Its forward-thinking approach had put it at the center of a telecommunications revolution. Bell Labs was very much a unique place. There was the ability to take a chance. Most of today's information age came from discoveries made at Bell Laboratories. Why, here at the Bell Labs, it's part of our duty to look as far ahead as possible. The Bell Labs engineer was thinking away, completely divorced from what was happening just a few miles away in downtown New York. EAT really tried to bring those incredibly disparate worlds together. You become drawn to something, which in this case was the art world. Billy Kluver was a gifted engineer from Bell Labs with an irrepressible passion for New York's art scene. At the love parties, everybody came and you danced like crazy. In those days, Bell Labs, you could pursue your own interest, and his interest was in going to New York and meeting the artist. My name is Julie Martin. I've been working with EAT since 1967, and we're now sitting in Bob Rauschenberg's kitchen. The kitchen is where a lot of meetings and parties and good conversation took place. In those days, Billy really felt that technology was very specific. It didn't take into account social ideas. He felt art could broaden what the engineer would think about when they were making the technology. Bob Rauschenberg also had this idea that art could spark something. The artist Jean Tangli asked Kluver if he would help build a automated machinic contraption that would destroy itself. I want to make a big machine and it's going to throw things all over the place. At that point, I realized that I could do something technical for the artist. That really spurred a whole series of relationships. Kluver did everything from helping to devise Andy Warhol's Silver Clouds. Kluver also helped Jasper Johns with a neon letter for one of Johns's paintings. The artists really were interested by the possibilities of what this new technology could bring to them. First, I thought that the engineer could be sort of material for the artist that the engineer could provide solutions and all of that. But Bob saw it as a collaboration. And that was the breakthrough. In January 1966, 
10 artists from New York and 30 engineers from Bell Telephone Laboratories began a collaboration that resulted in a series of dance, music, and theater works. Nine evenings took place at the 69th Regiment Armory in New York. I'm Bob Whitman. I was one of the artists that worked on the, on the uh, nine evenings. I had the idea that I could use this space to like a drive-in movie theater, except the movies drove in instead of the people. Through Billy's possession and Bob's charm, we ended up here doing the nine evenings. She said, what do you do in Milan? She said, nothing. She plays the triangle. She takes it. Each performer had a different way of dealing with the space. Bob Rauschenberg had a tennis game. In the handle of the racket was a little small FM transmitter, and so every time the ball was hit, there'd be a loud bomb, and a light would go out. The wireless mic and wireless transmissions didn't exist then, so it had to be made. The artist wanted this idea of wireless. It was really a sense of the possibilities of being free. For John Cage's performance, he had hooked up many different sound inputs, and it created this kind of cacophony. The acoustics of this space are quite amazing. Cage loved the idea of working with the echo with the reverberation. It really focused on the fact that technology is unpredictable. Over 10,000 visitors came to witness the events unfold over the course of the now legendary Nine Evenings. John Cage says uh, that when the artists and their engineers work together, something else happens. Something new might happen, something different. Billy began to realize that the collaboration between an artist and an engineer, this one-to-one -one collaboration, could make work that had never existed before, but also could change the engineer's idea about what he or she was, was working on. Robert Whitman, Fred Waldauer, Robert Rauschenberg, and I decided to form experiments in art and technology and set up a matching system to put artists directly in touch with engineers. Groups grew up around the United States. People would write us and say, can we start our EAT group? And we said, sure. It was exciting. They grew into an organization of more than 5,000 members, which is absolutely unprecedented and unlike anything else in the history of art. EAT grew interested in engaging with different sectors of society. And with the advent of the new technology, Industry was inevitably going to become a bigger player in the arts. EAT was keen to engage with this modern reality. The first world exposition to be held in Asia. Estimates project over 10,000 people per day will pass through the Pepsi pavilion. Pepsi Cola approached us to design and program a pavilion for Expo 70 in Osaka, Japan. This extraordinary project brought together 63 artists, engineers, and scientists. The artists got a chance to look at the building. Uh, they sort of didn't like it. And so the question came up, what do you do with a building you don't like? And almost with one voice, the artist said, you cover it with fog. We found Fujiko Nakaya, and she designed the fog system. For me, this is a fog sculpture. I wanted enough fog to hide the building so that people can feel it, play in it, hide in it. Many of the artists involved with EAT expressed an interest in things that floated um, and things also that would be uh, variable with the conditions that they were in. What they agreed on from the very beginning was the idea that you could make a very rich, 
environment that the person could uh, explore and, in a sense, create their own experience. I might have said something like, well, you can always make a giant spherical mirror. The image of the people was hanging from the ceiling upside down, like a ghost. Now, the cool thing about this is that everybody has a unique view. The mirror is 90 feet in diameter. It's never been done before. I'm John Pierce. I was the architect for the pavilion in Japan at Expo 70. In that time, in the early phases of satellite communication, the government was putting silver balloons up into space to bounce off waves. The very first telecommunications satellite was essentially a silver cloud. This was the first time someone had been inside a structure like this. As you move through, you'd get this incredible wash of colors and people interacting. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> It was a very organic space people stayed in. Some people we found sat down and had their lunches there. <laughs> I think the whole goal ultimately, as I remember it, was to disperse the regular flow of people so they, they became the exhibit. They became the exhibit. Part of why they were so focused on having the audience uh, participate was because of the fear of mass conformity that they absolutely wanted to resist. EAT is saying, let's work with these technologies, but let's not just accept what they're handing to us. EAT really tried to work with the brave new world and do something different with it. Artists now are looking at everyday programs that we use with an eye to the fact that they're actually extremely structured programs that have been created by a corporation. Even though you can build a technology that you think everything's built into it, you'll have an artist come along and say, well, why can't I? And they want to do more. Corey Archangel explicitly looks at the history of technology itself. Corey has pushed Photoshop um, to a totally different end, and he, he basically makes the software do something it wasn't designed to do, and that's a very EAT. Some of the first thinking of, about EAT was that it would not last forever. Billy and Bob and, and Bob Whitman really felt that EAT had established this idea of the artist and engineer working together they felt very proud of the relationships that they'd built. Billy and I got together about 1974. A lot of the engineers lived around here because Bell Labs is right down the road. I asked uh, my, my boss, why did you let me get away with all of this? At first, the self-destructing machine, and then uh, the nine evenings, and then all the subsequent works. He, he answered straight away. There was too much enthusiasm there. So he made the right decision to let me go, change the world, which is, of course, what we wanted to do. In the 50 years since Billy Kluver and Robert Rosenberg inspired a conversation between artists and engineers, perhaps now more than ever, EAT offers a powerful model for how we can confront the future and make our experience in it a positive one. As I look back on it, all of this collaboration and respect for people's ideas, uh, yes, I, I suspect it really had a huge influence on me. The amount of energy that went into it, the amount of commitment to each other, you know, it was really strong. It's hard to describe the spirit of cooperation, collaboration, and generosity. You know, you wish this kind of thing would happen uh, more often. <laughs>